This begins chapter 20, and the topic is high-level graphics. In this case, what we're going to be using a lot more now is this lower right-hand window in our studio. This is where plots will occur when they are generated. So here is the tab for plots, and I made this window just slightly bigger so we can see what's happening here. Here is the data set I would like to look at, and it is the quakes data set. Let me review it quickly here. If we look at the first few elements of quakes, there they are. They are the latitude, longitude, depth, magnitude, and number of stations that are picked up for 1,000 earthquakes. With this data, it's always worthwhile looking at sample statistics. So go ahead and put, maybe I'll gather these depths into a vector called quakes, or I'm sorry, a vector called y. Let's just do that. Now they're all in a vector y, and here it is that's got a thousand depths in it. First one is 562, the next one is 650, etc. And sometimes it's worthwhile doing sample statistics. So if I want the mean of y, it'll tell me 311 is the average depth. I can get the standard deviation of these depths, and that's 215. That tells me a little something. But it's also worthwhile occasionally getting some graphics that can help describe the data set. And one of those graphics is a histogram. So if I say histogram of those depths, over here in the right-hand window, lower right-hand window, R will generate a histogram. So this is a histogram of Y. And you can now see that this is what's referred to as a bimodal distribution in that there is a mode somewhere between 50 and 100. And there appears to be another mode somewhere between 550 and 600. So there's a number of questions that might be asked why there is a Two, why there are two modes here. Now this might be a mode right here between 200 and 250, but that might also be sampling variability. You never know. In that histogram command, if I want to come back to here, I can also add another parameter, and I'm going to use the sequence command here. I can say I want to go from 0 to 700 because I notice already that my my uh, histogram shuts off there or cuts off at 700. And I can add in a by parameter of 70. And this will give me different histogram limits. So when I hit return here, I get a slightly different look to my histogram. Now the, the widths of the cells are uh, 70 each. And we still get this mode that is out here. The one we were concerned about that might be a mode has disappeared and the one here has kind of shifted to the left a little bit. So you have to be careful interpreting the histogram because how you bin your observations can make a difference. Next thing I'm going to look at is I'm again going to stick with univariate data, but this time I'm going to look at something called the empirical cumulative distribution function, often abbreviated ECDF. So in this case, I'm going to say plot.ecdf, it's a built-in function, of the depths which are contained in y. I like putting in two extra parameters here, and they are verticals equals true, and I put in a plotting character, a plotting character of nothing, the null string there. When you do that, over on the right, you now get an empirical cumulative distribution function, and that empirical distribution function will go up by one one thousandth every single time it encounters one of the data values. And this is what it looks like. So that first mode of the distribution is somewhere in here where it's very steep. Then the second mode appears to be out here somewhere where again it is steep. So those, those are valuable insights that can be drawn from the ECDF. And here you don't have to worry about binning. It'll always look the same. I will type over here what is the minimum of y, and it is 40. 
So on the vertical, I'm um, no sorry, the horizontal axis here at 40 is where it makes its first move upward, and 680, which is out here, is where it makes its last upward move. So that is the empirical cumulative distribution function. Another useful function that is out there is called the QQ plot. QQ standing for quantile quantile. Here's the way that works. If I want QQ norm of Y, what I'm asking here is, is the normal distribution, the bell-shaped curve, a good fit to this particular data set of the earthquake depths? So when you hit return, you get this for a normal QQ plot. If this were to be a straight line or approximately a straight line, you would say that the normal distribution is a good fit here. This is nowhere near a straight line, so the conclusion is it's not going to be a good fit. Another thing you can add is what's known as a QQ line to the depth data, and let's let the color be red for the line so it will stand out a little bit more. And it will basically draw in a line that will help you see whether or not this is doing a good job of falling in a straight line. And obviously for this particular data set, it's not. Why is it not doing a good job of fitting the normal distribution? Well, it's because it's a bimodal distribution from our histograms. And we know that the uh, normal distribution is the bell-shaped curve. So we have a bad fit here, and that's to be expected. Here is another command. This is, again, for univariate data. And this is known as a box plot. The command is just that, box plot. You put in your data values, which are the depths, and it will draw a box plot for you. The solid line in the middle of the box is the median of the distribution, or the 50th percentile. The bottom of the box here is the 25th percentile. The top of the box is the 75th percentile. This goes down to the minimum data value. And if you remember from before, right here, the minimum is 40. And this extends to the maximum value, and that is 680. There is, I believe, a function called 5num, which will get you those exact values if you want them. 5num summary of a, of a distribution, the 40 is the minimum, the 99 is the 25th percentile, the 247 is the median, the 543 is the estimate for the 75th percentile, and finally, the 680 is the largest value out there that is in the data set. One of the weaknesses of histograms is they don't stack up well when you have multiple data sets. However, these box plots, you can separate out very nicely. And I'm going to go ahead and do an example of a box plot where you have several populations. So in this case, I'm going to do count as a function of spray, and my data set will be insect sprays. I'm going to click on that. When I hit return, again, this is an agricultural experiment, and there are six different types of insect sprays that are being used. And what we're using as the independent variable is spray, and that's going to be A, B, C, D, E, and F. And what we're using as the dependent variable is the count of the number of bugs in that particular um, plot. Um, and in that case, you can see we're running from 0 through 25 here. And this gives you a quick view of six different box plots. You can see that the insect sprays C, D, and E are vastly superior to A, B, and F. You can also see that the box plot function by default will identify outliers. And in the case of insect spray C, 
and insect spray D, there was an outlier, and so that should be accounted for perhaps as well. Again, a quick view of six different data sets on one plot. Next thing we can move to is multivariate data. And in this case, I'm going to look at two-dimensional data. I'm going to look at something called a scatter plot. We're going to do that scatter plot with the plot function, and we will be putting in an X and a Y. One thing I might be interested in plotting is quakes dollar sign longitude on the x-axis and quakes dollar sign latitude on the y-axis. And when I do so, here you see is a picture of where those 1,000 earthquakes occurred. You can see they seem to be clustering here in the upper left-hand corner in a very regular pattern and these are probably due to those shifting of the tectonic plates. Same thing over here on the right-hand side. You see a real pattern to where they are. Now, one thing you can do here is you can use another plotting function, which is known as symbols. And I'll once again put in quakes, dollar sign, longitude, quakes, dollar sign, latitude. But in this case, I want to take circles and put those in as 10 raised to the quakes dollar sign magnitude. What's going on here is instead of plotting the same size circle for each of the 1,000 earthquakes, I'm going to take the bigger earthquakes in terms of their magnitude on the Richter scale and I'm going to plot them a little bit bigger than the others. So when I push return, all of a sudden you can see the really big quakes turn out to be from this upper left-hand cluster here. They still have some big quakes here, but the really huge ones are occurring over here. Now that kind of ran off the scale, so if you need to, you can come back and you can multiply this. For example, if I want to multiply this, maybe make them a little bit smaller. Maybe I'll put them maybe three-tenths that size. And that didn't change things at all. So we'd have to work a little bit with that to get those circles a little bit smaller because they ran off the axes. The other thing is I can do is I can control the axes and that will be discussed in the, the next, uh, next chapter. You can also do a three-dimensional plot. And in this case, I'm going to use the pairs command. And here is one example. If I say pairs of the built-in data set trees, what it will do is there are three variables that are being gathered on these trees. The girth of the tree, the height of the tree, and the volume of the tree. And what you have here are scatter plots of, in this case, off to the left, you have girth versus height. Down in the lower left, you have girth versus volume. And then down here in the lower left, you have height versus volume. So you can see some similarities between these plots, of course, as you go across the diagonal because you simply have the two axes reversed. Another example of a three-dimensional plot is going to be stars, trees, and I'm going to say draw.segments equals true. And here is that same data set, which is trees. And this time, what we're going to do is, for each of the trees, this is kind of an overhead view of the trees, and you're getting those three different variables collected on the trees, namely the girth of the tree, the height of the tree, and the volume of the tree. And for each tree, those are out here kind of in a pie diagram. And when you can see one of those dominates the other two, as it does in this case right here, that shows up. 
Another example are some three-dimensional plots is the contour plot. And if I look at CrimTab, which is some data that has been collected on criminals, that's where the crim comes from, you can see here is one of the variables collected on the horizontal axis, another one on the vertical axis, and you can see this will give us a contour plot of that particular data set. You can think of that in some ways as a mountain. Another is the image command. Say image crim, crim tab and it'll kind of give you a heat plot. And you can also get a perspective plot. And in this case, you get a three-dimensional plot, kind of a wire diagram of what the distribution looks like. And again, you, uh, it's just a third view of that particular data. One last thing you can do is you can do a TS plot. And this is the last topic we're going to hit here. And this is time series data. And there is a function called TS plot. And you can put, for example, the air passengers data in there. And in this case, you get a plot of the air passengers data, which starts out here in the 1940s and moves into the 1960s a little bit. And you see a nice pattern developing every year Travel has kind of a cyclic orientation to it and has the same types of things. So this is a time series where you can see it is growing, perhaps in a linear or maybe even a quadratic uh, manner. And then within that, you have a seasonality component. So these are high-level graphics. And the next topic we're going to look at is how these graphics can be customized.